right, so we're continuing our study on the seed of promise through the Bible, starting in Genesis, where we have the seed of a woman, which is the promise of redemption of life, the destruction of Satan. Next, today, we have seed of Abraham, which is the promise of the Spirit, the promise of the blessing of God. And the next week, we have the seed of David, which is the promise of the coming kingdom and the building of the house of God. So seed of Abraham. So the seed is Christ. So the seed of Abraham is Christ. It is a prophesied promise of the spirit. And whenever there's prophecy, it's, it's a, the, a prophecy is a, a prophesied promise. So when the promise comes to pass, then the prophecy is fulfilled and it's, the promise with the seed of Abraham was made to Abraham and Christ. And the, it, the promise was fulfilled in us. We received the promise. So the seed of Abraham brings in the blessing of God, which is his spirit, his Holy Spirit. Christ became a blessing to all people of all nations. Prophesied to Abraham that through him, all nations will be blessed. The forefather of God's chosen people, the father of faith. And through our faith, we are sons of God and sons of Abraham. And that's just like a small little um, um, preview. So we're going to get into it. So Genesis 12. Now Genesis 12 is the prophesied promise to Abraham. And it's fulfilled in Galatians Three, So Genesis 12 and there's also, you know, other ones and Galatians, specifically three and four, they're paired together because the Old Testament are examples and pictures of the spiritual truths and the revelation of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. That when we read the New Testament, we are able to understand the Old Testament because it's about Jesus. It's typology. Typology is my passion, and that's how I teach. I tie the Old Testament and the New Testament together so we can see what's behind the Old Testament, and we can see what the New Testament revelations look like on the face of people and actual examples and stories that are in the Old Testament. And everything has purpose and there is a reason for every word. God wastes nothing. And this Bible is the word of God and it's a gift to us. And we need to be in it every day because it is life. It is our food. It is, it is everything we need to be here on this earth, to live now in a way that we will be living in eternity, that we are prepared for when we die, we will be standing before God and we do not want to be standing before him empty handed. We want to have gifts for a king that are suitable for a king. And those gifts are what we've done in our life for him. So if we live with empty hands here, meaning not for ourselves, but for the purposes of God and for others, we won't be empty handed before him there. So Genesis 12, one through three, it says, now the Lord said to Abram before Abraham was called Abraham. He was Abram. He said, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we're going to break this down. So Abraham or Abram was called out of idolatry. When God said, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house, he was being called by God, but he was being called out of something. He was being called out of idolatry um, in and he was being called out of the land of idolatry. So in Joshua 24, 2 through 3, 
It says, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and led him through out all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. So also, so right here it says, your father's including Terah. So Terah is Abram, Abraham's, Abraham's father and they served other gods. So in Acts 7, 2 through 3, it says, And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. So this is very important. So when God called Abraham, he called him out of the land of his fathers, out of his dwelling, where he was from. Now, he was from Mesopotamia. So Abraham's father, and we're going to discuss that right now. Abraham's father, Terah, was an idol maker. There are historical accounts of Abraham smashing all his father's idols to pieces. So, and I learned this because I, I read the ancient, ancient books. I read on Jerusalem history. I, I, um, whenever there's like Mesopotamia or Abraham or Terah, I do a profile study. And um, that's, it, it, it brings it into fuller perspective. So Mesopotamia was the land of Abraham and his father's house. And it is the present day Iraq and Northeast Syria. Now the Assyrians and the Babylonians were among the peoples who originated from and dominated the region from 3100 BC to 539 BC. Now ancient Mesopotamian religion was the first recorded ever. Now this is interesting and disclaimer, this is not a, a debate. I'm not arguing anything. I am not saying anything about it, but I find this very interesting that the first religion recorded was in Mesopotamia. And what they believed was that the earth was a flat disk surrounded by space and above it heaven. They believed water was everywhere and the earth was born out of the sea. Now, we have to understand that Mesopotamia was a polytheistic religion. That means they believed in many gods and they worshiped a god named Enlil. Now Enlil was the air god whom they believed was most powerful and he was the offspring of two other gods. Now, Ur was a city in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is the country Ur of the Chaldeans where Abraham was called out of Abram was a city in Mesopotamia founded in 3800 BC and it was known as one of the world's first true cities. Now its patron god was Nana, a moon god. Its cities, the, so the, its city's name is literally abode of the moon god. So I say this to say this. <laughs> Mesopotamia, the first ancient religion, was based on the foundation that they thought the earth was a disk. And out of this belief was erected all of these gods they worshiped through the, through hundreds of years, through the Old Testament era. And it went on past that, but, and it was the air god, the moon god. So that was the basis, the foundation of these erected false religions and false gods. So what I'm saying right now, this is not a debate, but what I'm saying is Samuel, or not Samuel, but Solomon, King Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. So when we hear these trending debates 
and these arguments and these theories, they're not new. They originated from somewhere. And the one that's happening right now originated from the belief system that upheld the deity of false gods. So we have to be careful. We have to search out the thing before we grab onto it because we are aligning with ancient religions that oppose God. So that's about Mesopotamia and the Ur Chaldeans, the Ur of the Chaldeans where Abram was called out of. It was a land of idolatry. It was a land of sin. And his father was, is a, a, a recorded um, idol maker. So after Terah's death, so God called Abram. He said, out of the land of your father's house, out of your relatives. He wasn't telling to take his father, but Abram take, took his father and Sarah and his nephew Lot. And he dwelt in Haran for a while. He couldn't go any further because God didn't call him to take people who worshiped idols with him into the promised land. He said to come out of your father's house, come out of your relatives, come out of the land of idolatry, separate yourself and come to the land I am showing you. Does this sound familiar? This is a New Testament command. What Paul says, we need to come out of it, separate yourself in order to go into somewhere. We are called out in order to go in to another place. And many people don't want to come out or if they come out, they want to bring everything with them that is the place they're being called out of. And it can be, you know, you can use that to fit anything, whether it's our past, relationships, whatever it may be. So after Sarah's death, Abraham continued his journey into the land of Canaan, which is the land of promise. So Genesis 12, 7 says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now go to Genesis 17, 7 through 8. It said, and God said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. He says, I will be their God. So Jeremiah 11.10 says, and please hang with me because this is a phenomenal teaching and it just keeps getting better. So Jeremiah 11.10 says, they have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. So God spoke to Abraham saying, I'm making an everlasting covenant with you to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. See, Abraham didn't receive the, 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 the promised land or the promised seed in his lifetime. He continued his walk of faith his entire life without seeing the fulfillment of the promise. But he still stayed faithful to God. So... Now, if you go on, if I'm going back, it says, and all the land of Canaan, I'm back in Genesis 17, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So the covenant was made to Abraham, but he wasn't there to see the fulfillment of the covenant, which was made to him, which was fulfilled with the house of Israel. Now the covenant began with Abraham, but it wasn't fulfilled tell Israel, tell this, um, tell the forming of Israel, it was past Moses. So in Jeremiah, what it's talking about is 
the people who the covenant was made, the fulfilled, made with, turned back to their iniquities and refused to hear the words of God. And they have gone, off, gone after other gods to serve them, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now I'm saying this for a reason. We're going to tie it all together. Just keep going with me. Have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Okay, now, this is the point. This is the picture this paints, which is in the New Testament, which is a truth revealed to us by Paul, by the Holy Spirit. Paul is the Holy Spirit, but he wrote about it in the New Testament. But these are the truths of God. So we are to come out of the land of idolatry and sin, to never look back and to never go back. See, Abraham came out of the land of idolatry and then it took him in and, and then he came out of his father's house away from his relatives to be separated from them that he could enter into the promised land and there he received a covenant with God that would be fulfilled in the house of Israel. Now the house of Israel, they turned their back on God turned to sin to serve other gods and they broke the covenant and they wrestled with God many centuries so we are not to look back Paul says that we put our hand to the plow we don't look back we don't go back to the land of idolatry we don't go back to our lifestyle of sin we don't go back to the relationships and and the things in our past that that don't allow us to cultivate new soil so that the word can take root and bring forth a harvest for God we have to come out of the land into a new land the land of promise which the land of promise is typology of Jesus he is the good land he is the promised land he is the seed and he is all the provisions of the land flowing with milk and honey he is the rock and he is the water that came bursting and gushing out of the rock when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt he is the manna that rained down from heaven he is everything now he is the spirit that is in our spirit which is numa our very breath we have to understand that he is everything he is the seed he is the land he is the promise he is the provision so we are to not look back and we are to press on to jesus christ but the israelites didn't do that so in philippians 3 13, uh, 3, 12 through 14, it says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead i press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of god in christ jesus the upward call of god in christ jesus so colossians 2 6 through 7 it says as you therefore have received christ jesus the lord so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding in it with thanksgiving see it abounding in it with thanksgiving the it is the promised land that is christ whom we are to walk in and be rooted in you know paul also says that we take off the old man and we put on the new man we are to not walk according to the old man but we are to walk in the new man we are to put on christ we have to understand that the new man is christ there's no new us we are not a new man Christ is the new man in whom we choose because we are called out of the old man that is dead through the crucifixion on the cross and we enter into the promised land which is Christ and we put on Christ and we are to be rooted in him built up in him how to be built up in him as he is built up in us and we are to walk in him and to not look back 
We are not to go back and forth between the land of idolatry and the land of promise, which is Christ. We are not to go back and forth between the old man and the new man. So Christ is our faith, who we are established in, abounding in that faith, whom he is the author and finisher of. That's in Hebrews. The seed of Abraham, the father of faith, the seed of Abraham is Christ. Abraham was the father of faith. Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. And we are sons of God through faith in Christ. And we are sons of Abraham through him faith because he is through him the promised seed and he is the father of faith. The first one to believe the promise in which we is fulfilled in us when we believe in Christ who is that seed. It is astounding. It is so good. So we are called out of idolatry to be a chosen generation who follow and dwell in God through Christ, who is our promised land to sit at his table, Christ's table. So Matthew twenty two fourteen, you know, the saying for many are called, but few are chosen. It's also in Matthew twenty sixteen. For many are called, few are chosen. And I used to be very confused by that verse for a long time. And, 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 and the general, especially in the Western um, society, the Western part of, of, of Christianity, it's made out to be something to make people feel special about themselves. The elite, I am special, I am called, I have a calling, I am chosen by God in an elevated way above all the rest of the body. It's, it's a mindset that has permeated the Western um, Christian culture. But I'm here to tell you that's not what that means. You wanna know what that means? Ab Abram being called out of the land of idolatry and chosen to dwell in the land of promise, having left idolatry and sin and left everything that was connected to that land that still served that land. That's what that means. Because many are called to Christ. In order to call, be called to Christ, we have to come out of something. If we think that we can stay in our own lifestyle, in sin, in idolatry, in the system of the world, doing the things as our main enjoyment, just catering to the lusts of our flesh, we are not in Christ. We are not. And we cannot be deceived. We have to come out of that. We are told several times in the New Testament in order to enter into, yes, his spirit comes into our hearts, but that is not the end and into our spirit. His spirit comes into our spirit, but he wants to make a home in our heart. And in order for him to make a home in our heart, the, the land of idolatry and our father's house in, in regards to Abram, the, the things that are, that are support and uphold the old, environment the kingdom of darkness we have to separate ourselves from that not just physically but in our soul through sanctification that jesus can come in and make his home in there you know um god said to king david he said who will make a home for me a place where i can dwell you know and and it's so ironic because because um, King David in, in the Psalms, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. You know, and God asked King Solomon, who was David's son, he asked him, what do you want from me? What would you desire? And I will give it to you. And he said, wisdom to govern your people. You know, he asked that same question to King David. And King David's response was, give me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me because he had a heart for God. That's how he had a heart for God. That was David's desire and it needs to be ours also. We need to create a place for, for God to make his home, a place that is worthy of him. And we do that by lying down our lives, coming out of the land of idolatry, lying down our lives and taking up the life of Christ. So in being called to God, we are called out of idolatry and 
in the world and out of the world in its satanic system, which is the kingdom of darkness. Because Romans 9, 24 through 25, it says, Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. That is what God's calling us to. He's calling out us out of the kingdom of darkness into his light that we can be his people. We have to be called out of in order to enter into in first Peter. 2, 9 through 10, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We are a chosen generation called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Many are called, few are chosen. Many are called out, but very few go in. And that's a reality because they do not want to leave the land of Mesopotamia. So in Revelation 17, 14, it says, these will make war with the lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Those with him are called, chosen, faithful. Many are called, few are chosen. But if you enter in, you are called chosen. And we are all members of of Christ's body. We are all members of one another. There is no elevation. You know, Jesus says that the hidden parts of the body bestow greater honor. The ones that are seen and out there, they have an important part, but the ones are hidden that receive no real applause or don't even get noticed. Those parts are bestowed a greater honor. God did that because he is a, a just God. He is a loving God. He's a compassionate God. And he shows no partiality, no favoritism. And to those that think they're not, he says, you are even more so. And those that think they are so, he says, you are still even down here with those who may appear to be not, if that makes sense. All right, we're going on to the next point. We're taking a, a journey with Abraham. This is so important. This really, I had fun doing this um, lesson. It really gave, I had so much revelation doing this. I, I did, I've been in this lesson for about two and a half weeks now, three weeks. So the promise of descendants is another aspect of the seed of promise, the seed of Abraham through whom all the nations of the earth is blessed. So Genesis 26, four says, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. There's another part. And we're going to come back to this, but in Genesis 22, 17 through 18, God says, blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply you. He's saying this to Abram and your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand, which is on the seashore. He says that your stars that are in heaven and the, the, the sands that are on the seashore. Now in another one, and we're going to get to that also, he says to Abraham, I will multiply your descendants like the dust of the earth. So we have, he's comparing the descendants, God is, to Abraham, to the stars in the heaven, 
to the dust of the earth, to the sand of the seashores. Now, this is so amazing. So this puts two categories of descendants of the seed of Abraham. Now, Abraham had descendants that are of the dust of the sand and descendants of the stars of heaven. But the promised seed only came through one. So there are two kinds of descendants. One of the earth, the dust of the earth and the sands of the seashore, and one of the heavens, which is the stars of the heavens. God mentions this several times in the Old Testament, and it's for a reason. So there are two kinds of descendants that descended from Abraham, but the seed of promise only came through one of the groupings of descendants, which there's only two. So you have the descendants of the earth, which is born according to the flesh, because in Genesis 13, 6, it says, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth and your descendants also could be numbered. And then we have the descendants of heaven, born according to the promise, born according to the spirit, which is the New Testament believers. Genesis 15, 5 says, then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. So we see this broken down in the New Testament in Galatians. There were two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, with two covenants, the Old Testament law and the New Testament believers. That's in Galatians 4, 24 through 26. We're going to get there. So Galatians 4, 22 through 23, it says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. So Abraham, just backstory, God fulfilling his promise to him of having descendants was taking a long time. So his wife Sarah said, take my maidservant Hagar, go into her so that she can give you a son. But that's not what was God's plan. So that's what he did. And there was born Ishmael. And then God... When the time was right to fulfill God's perfect plan and purposes, Sarah became pregnant and brought forth a son, Isaac, through whom the seed of promise would come. So back to Galatians 4, 22 through 23, it says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was the bond of the bondwoman was, was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Now let's go to Romans 9, 6 through 8. This is so good. It says, but it is not that the word of God, this is Paul talking, the word of God has taken no effect. For they are all not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is what God has said to him. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. And it also, when he goes into Galatians 4, he says that the two are at enmity, they war and fight against each other, even to this day, which there is a world, two world religions or, or belief systems that are constantly at war, Israel and their neighboring countries, they're two, they are still to this day at war. But in spiritual terms, this is referring to two kinds of believers. The spiritual and natural who live according to the spirit or the flesh according to the old man or the new man because in first corinthians 15 47 through 49 it says the first man was of the earth made of dust right god said to abraham i'll make your descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth 
The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, that is, before we believe in Christ and follow him, we bore the image of the old man, the man made of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, which is the new man, the man that is seated in the heavens. So we see here, see, there are some um, um, theologians where they say that the dust of the earth, so the two descendants are the Jewish, the Israelites, that they still believe according to the Old Testament law, and then, and then those who believe in Jesus, the New Testament, the seed of promise, that's the distinguishment. But right here, what I'm talking about is the two kinds of believers that this is talking about. Those who live according to the old man, man of the dust, and those who live according to the new man, man of the heavenlies. So there is spiritual and natural who live according to the spirit or the flesh, according to the old man or according to the new man. And Paul talks about this in Romans when he says the two are at war against each other. Does this sound familiar? Galatians 4 is talking about the, the son of the bond woman and the son of the free woman warring against each other. And then we have the old man, the man of the flesh, living according to the flesh, the flesh, and the new man who is according to the spirit, the spirit warring against each other. There is a natural picture, but a spiritual truth behind it. And that is a pattern in the Bible. So 1 Corinthians 15, 47 through 49, it says the first man, I already read that, sorry. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And he goes on in Galatians 5, 16 through 18, he says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. That's the war. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And under the law is to be under a curse, which Jesus came to redeem us from. So he is speaking about two descendants, two groups of descendants that came from, from Abraham that are, that are um, signified by Ishmael, which was the born of the bondwoman and Isaac born of the free woman. And out of them came two lines of descendants. One that's according to the earth. One that's according to the spirit, heaven. And of these two, it is also a picture because these two are the sons of Abraham. Both believed, but both had different outcomes. So is as the believers, the New Testament believers that we are, if we believe in Christ, that we are either according to the flesh, living, seated in the earth, counted as dust, or we are according to the spirit. We are living according to the spirit in the heavenlies. Stars in the heavenlies. So now we're going to talk about seated in the heavenlies of the descendants. And I want to add one more thing. If we live according to the flesh, we perish. If we live according to the spirit, we live. It's very clear. One is rooted in death, which is the earth. If we live according to the earth, we're going to be judged with the earth. If we live according to the spirit, which is life, we're going to be judged according to the spirit, living by the spirit, which is eternal life, everlasting life. This is a very clear picture we need to see and take seriously. So seated in the heavenlies as the descendants as the stars of the heaven to possess the gates of our enemies. Because if you go to Genesis 22, 17 through 18, it said, 
It says, blessing, this is God speaking to Abraham, blessing, I will bless you, a multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. One is according to the flesh, one is according to the spirit, one is according to the flesh. Both believe, both are a seed out of Abraham, the father of faith, but both are, are dwelling in two separate locations on two separate paths, walking according to two separate things. So he says, the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now he put, laid out the descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And he says, there's a colon after that. So there's a separation, a new thought is coming after he says, and the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of the enemies. Which descendants? Because there's two in this category. And he continues, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now the descendants that shall possess the gate of, the enem of their enemies is the nations of the earth that shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed God's voice. They shall be blessed. He says, in your seed, not in, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, not in seeds, plural, but in your seed. The seed is Jesus. In that seed, when the fulfillment of that promise, when the fulfillment of that prophecy is fulfilled, when Jesus is, comes to earth as, the, as a man, as a baby who grew into a man and who died and rode on the cross, crucified on the cross, buried, rose again, that anyone who believes in his name will become sons and daughters of God through faith. But there is also a separation because Paul also, well, we're going to get to that. I don't want to get him myself. So in your seed, all the nations shall be blessed. He is making a distinguish between the two separate descendants, one of the earth and one of the heavens. The one of the heavens shall possess the gates of the enemy because it is one of the heavens that come through the seed of promise that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Blessed by what? Who? By Jesus, the promised seed of God who has come to fulfill in us by becoming the spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of Christ in our spirit. And through him, all the nations of the earth shall be called blessed. That is what he's talking about. So Ephesians 2, 5 through 6, it says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, the stars of the heaven. We are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are not seated on the earth. If we are following the ways of the world, we are seated with the world. But if we are following Christ, if we believe we are seated in Christ in heaven by abiding in him and him being in us, so we are to possess the gates of our enemies, to bring the kingdom, to take territory, the kingdom of God, to take territory, to have dominion and subdue it. We are not to be the dust of the earth, which Adam remained, but to subdue the earth from the heavenlies, seated with Christ in the heavenlies through abiding in him. He says, if my words are in you, and if you hear my commands, he said, me and my father, if you obey my commands, me and my father make our home in you. If you keep my words, I abide in you and you abide in me. 
We don't automatically abide just because we say we love Jesus. We need to follow him. We keep his word. If his word has found a home in us, in Matthew, Jesus talks about this when he says the soil takes the seed, which is sown, which is the word, and it takes root and brings forth a harvest of 30, 60, 100 fold. It's not choked out by the cares of the world. It's not snagged by Satan because it's, it's scorched in the sun. It's just chilling out there with the world. It never took root. We need to, to, to till the soil of our hearts with the word that the word cultivates our soil, which is God breathed. It's spirit. It's life. It's truth. Jesus came As the word again, the word put on flesh and dwelt among us and it takes root and it brings forth a harvest. And that harvest is Jesus. We reap the spirit. The fruits of the spirit is the outward expression of the inward dwelling of Christ in our spirit. So Matthew, now we're talking about possess the gates of their enemies. And this is incredible. So Matthew 11, 12. It says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Another verse I was really confused about until recently doing uh, these lessons. And and, um, what this means is what we were talking about. It's a teaching two weeks from this week. It was two lessons ago. It was, uh, they are bread for us. It's a very good teaching. I encourage you to watch it. Caleb and Joshua are a picture of possessing the gates of the enemy. That when Moses sent the uh, 12 spies to go in and spy out the land and survey it and come back, Joshua and Caleb were one of the two. There was a contrast of the Israelites who doubted God and Caleb and Joshua who complained. And then there was another that was Caleb and Joshua who believed God and say, let's go and possess the land. So all the descendants of Abraham are one of the earth or the other of heaven. One, you can see the, a way of a picture of their behavior in the Israelites who complained and didn't believe God and said, there's giants in the land. They're consuming us. Let's go back to Egypt, which Egypt is a picture of the land of enslavement, the land according to the world, the satanic system, the land of idolatry, of slavery. They said, let's go back to Egypt. Did you bring us out here to die? That's what they said to God. So God, God struck them. And that's another thing. We're not going to get into that right now, but it's in numbers. It's a really good story. But, um, but Caleb and Joshua, they were the two. So that's how the 10 spies testi- testified. The two, Caleb and Joshua said, and this is in numbers 14, nine, they said, and only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the Lord of the, or the, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. See, these are two separate examples of possessing the gates of the enemy and, and retreating back. And, and, and God says in the New Testament, he says, my soul takes no pleasure in one who draws back. Is very serious. We are not to draw back. We are go, we are to go forth in, in the faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. So now we go to Genesis 128. This is also a picture of possessing the gates of the enemy. In Genesis 128, it says that God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So the word for subdue, so this is what he charged Adam with. He gave Adam a position of authority. Now the authority he was to operate under was 
Christ was God, which was represented by the tree of life, which he failed to eat from. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which brought sin into man in the sinful nature, which is our flesh, the corrupted part of the body. And all that were, were born from Adam were born automatically into sin. That's why Jesus had to come to redeem us from the curse, from death and from sin by destroying the works of the devil. So the word subdue here, when God told Adam to subdue it, that word, the Hebrew word is, is knavish. It's K-N-A-V-I-S-H. The noun form of kavish, no, it's K-A-V-E-S-H. My, it auto-corrected, goofy. So that means a footstool. The word means a footstool, the noun form. The verb form means of kavesh, K-A-V-E-S-H, that, that's the correct spelling, literally means to place your foot on the neck of your conquered enemy, signifying submission. That's what Adam was charged to do. There are, you know, there's another aspect of it, which means to bring order out of cha into chaos. And that's another thing, but the, the prime thing, it means to subdue. It means to put your foot on the neck of your conquered enemy. That's what that means. Signifying submission, the enemy being submitted to the authority which Adam was meant to operate in. So now, the same word for subdue is used in Numbers 32, 29. And it says, And Moses said to them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben cross over the Jordan with you, every man armed for battle before the Lord, and the land is subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead as a possession. That means to put your foot on the neck of your conquered enemy, signifying submission. That's what that means to subdue. When Adam was created, there was already an enemy on this earth. And that is a whole other teaching that we're going to have hopefully soon. I'm just, I'm still studying it. It's so deep. But he was to subdue the earth by putting his foot on the neck of the enemy, which was Satan. But instead, he forfeited his position of authority that God charged him with to Satan through rebellion, rebelling against God. Now, you have to understand, when God said to Adam, he said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest you surely die. And what does Satan do? He came and tempted Eve by saying, did God really say? He said, you surely won't die. For God does not want your eyes to be open, for you shall see as God sees and know as God knows. He tempted them with an elevated position of seeing like God, that God is withholding from them. But God was not withholding from them because he tempted with them that their what? Their eyes would be open. But in entering in, when they ate from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have to understand. I'm, I'm going off my notes, but that's okay. You know what? I'm going to do this verse because what I'm about to say will make better sense. I get ahead of myself. I'm going to go do one more verse. Then what I'm about to say is going to make sense. And I actually had this revelation last night when I was going through my notes. This is just added and fresh. It was just opened up to me and I was like, it was amazing. So we are to subdue by putting our feet, our foot on the neck of our enemy, our conquered enemy. It's the enemy is submitted to us if we are operating under the authority of Christ. So, in Romans 16, 19 to 20, it says, 
as you know, for your obedience has become known to all. This is Paul talking to believers. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That is incredible. So when Jesus came and died on the cross, rose again in John 20, 22, I think it is, where he breathed on the disciple. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that is the very breath of Jesus. It's the spirit of Jesus. And he also says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And I give to you. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely you give. How do we do that? And, and Paul, he brings it together. He says, he says, therefore, he says, for your obedience has become known to all. That is us being walking in obedience to the word of God, the commands of Christ, to Christ in the abiding. It is very important. He says, therefore, therefore what? Because of their obedience. He is glad on their behalf. Why? Because the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly, the feet of the saints. And it's through walking in obedience. We cannot be deceived. We cannot be in sin or still just taking the pleasures of the world or living like we are not in the kingdom of light, but we are still playing and entertained by the kingdom of darkness. We are underneath. If we are over here, we are underneath a different authority. It's not the authority of Jesus because he restored to us what was meant for Adam. And that was being in a position of authority, subdue the earth, which is putting the foot to the neck of the enemy, taking back the earth from the enemy and restoring order by doing that. But instead of remaining in that position of authority and taking Christ as his life through the, the tree of the um, life, he rebelled against God by going against his word, by saying not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of evil, good and evil. When he ate from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he forfeited his position of authority and gave it to Satan where he put himself under the lordship, the, the dictatorship, the tyranny, the enslavement of Satan and sin, which is the nature, the personification of Satan came into man's flesh and he took dominion over the world and it became the kingdom of darkness and that's why the world is like it is but when Jesus died on the cross and rose again and we receive the spirit into us we are restored into the position of authority under Christ because he is the head we are the body and we are supposed to walk under that authority and we do, we remain under the position of the authority of Christ where we are to subdue the earth by putting our feet to the neck of the enemy by walking in obedience to him. He says, if I abide in you and you and me, you will do what I say. Read John 15, read 14 and 15, but 15, it is very plain. We cannot be deceived. We cannot be in both kingdoms and expect to have any authority or influence. We are serving Satan if we are compromised in any way. And this is a daily thing because even I, I even I, I like I, I I live a life that is so narrow and it's so um, tight and closed and and bubbled and but I, I I'm constantly fighting the pulling and the pushing and the the seduction of of trying the alluring that Satan comes at us with why because when we sin we commit adultery against God we are seduced by sin, by the lusts of our flesh and our mind. And Jesus said, he says, I tell you this, if you commit adultery in your heart, you've committed adultery. If we sin in our heart, we have sinned against God. If we entertain, and I just went through this of the, uh, uh, it's, it's such a, it's, we have to be so careful if even the thought, if we even think or, or we let it nestle in our heart a little bit, we are sinning against God. 
We are. And we, we place ourselves, we take ourselves, we forfeit uh, out of the, uh, the authority of Christ. We bring ourselves out from the authority of Christ and we placed ourselves underneath the dictatorship of Satan. We give him, he doesn't have authority, but we give him authority over us because he has become our master. And whomever under we, our master is to whom we serve and we become slaves. That is the truth of this. So Satan is crushed under the feet of believers who are in obedience, walking with Christ. As Adam forfeited his position under God's authority to have authority, so do we through rebellion and sin. In another part of Romans, it's Romans sixteen nineteen. it says, Paul says, therefore, he says, I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. What Paul, this is so, oh my gosh, the word is so incredible. What Paul is talking about right here is he is referring to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, be wise in what is good because good can be evil. And he said, and simple concerning evil. Don't complicate it. Don't, don't try and make excuses or, or justifications in your mind. We have to be simple. But evil is evil. And even good can be evil if we are not wise. And if we are that, if we are discerning of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is actually in our flesh, it's the sinful nature enticing us to eat of its fruit and not to eat of the fruit of life, which is in our spirit, that fruit's in our flesh, the lusts and the desires. He says, and if we are wise and simple concerning that tree, the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The grace of God is his very presence in us, enabling us to follow him because it is him inside of us, the spirit that we walk according to. That's how we're able to follow him. It's himself in us, empowering us and enabling us to walk with him by walking in us. It's fantastic. So why is it what is good? Simple concerning evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is very complicated. It's very complicated. It's the systems of the world. You know what's in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Culture. Culture. Education. Politics. The systems of the world. The complexities of trying to discern what is good and evil. That's a complex thing with both of them are rooted in death. That's why we need the righteousness of God and not the righteousness of ourselves. Self-righteousness is rooted in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We live according to the spirit, which is the righteousness of Christ in us that leads to life because the tree of life is simple. The tree of life to know the knowledge of good and evil is to know all the complexities of sin and darkness in the world, even if it's masked in light and goodness. But to know the tree of life is to know Christ and it's to know life and it's simple. We were meant to know Christ who is life and in him <laughs> are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ, in the tree of Christ. God put Adam in front of the tree of Christ and he said, I desire you to eat of all the trees, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest you surely die. But they wanted their eyes because of Satan tricking them that their eyes be open to know and to see as God. Well, in the tree of life, which is Christ, is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If they would have ate from the tree, they would have known as God knows because God knows life. We are not to know Satan. That is not who we are supposed to have a, a relationship or a knowledge or a knowing of. We are meant to know God and be known by him. So that in him is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's so much more than the tree of life. 
And they forfeited that. And how often do we, when we choose to walk according to our flesh, according to the carnal thinking, rather than the spirit, which is the mind of Christ, which is so much more and so much deeper, so much fulfilling than anything else we seek to know. But we are still relate ourselves as those who live in the world because we, we are seated on heaven because we are still in the old man following our flesh. But we, if we are seated in Christ, we are seated in heaven as the stars of heaven with Christ, as the analogy that, that God made the stars of heaven. We are seated with Christ and we are not on this earth. We are in heaven. We, that is our identity. So when we walk according to the flesh, we walk according to the world because the world testifies to the flesh that I am good because it fulfills the lust of the flesh. That's why we don't want to come out of the land of idolatry because it's comfortable, because it feels good, because it's familiar, because it doesn't take us sacrificing ourselves on the altar in order to know and take hold of God, which is our real life, our true life. We must forsake our soul life, which is conformed to the world to sin to the land of idolatry and the land of our fathers to be to be conformed to the the spirit the the transformed by the, the renewing of our mind according to the word in abiding in Christ through obedience which is a cost and that cost is us which we so try to hang hold of but we just let us go we're dead we don't it's so much better the spirit the life the true life that we were created to have in Christ is our real life and it's so much more but it causes us to dissociate disconnect and divorce the world the world offers us nothing but if we continue to live according to the world we will be judged according to the world and the world is going to be consumed by fire and the world is going to be judged according to Satan Satan is going to be judged with the world and if we live according to the world we're living according to Satan and we will be judged according to him because it's him who we've chosen to align ourselves with it's him who we we've chosen to serve under even if we are in the church if we are not aligned in the spirit to Christ we are not aligned with Christ he says that we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light of the son of his love there is a translation but if we refuse to make that journey if we refuse to make that turn we will be continue to be judged to live and be condemned with the kingdom of darkness and it's very serious it doesn't matter what we say it matters what we do and so second corinthians so the serpent which is satan promised to open adam and eyes eve adam and adam and eve's eyes when they sin by eating partaking of the tree but instead they were blinded and all descendants were born blind, conceived in sin. Who were they blind to? They were blinded to God. They were blinded to God. They were blinded to light. They remained in darkness. Second Corinthians 4.4 4, And I never say anything unless I have a scripture, scripture, at least one or two or three to back it up. Second Corinthians 4.4 4, It says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of God, of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You know, it even says that those like, you know, there is a veil. But once we turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. It's in, it's, I think it's in 2 Corinthians. We need to turn from the Lord, but we have to turn from something. And that is idolatry and sin, ourselves and the world and our own thinking. We are to live according to Christ, not according to us. We no longer have the, the right to be dictated by our emotions, by our natural thinking, by, by our past experiences. Paul says, I count all those things but, uh, as dung, which is poop, that I may gain Christ. That's what he means. So the old testament battled according to the flesh we're coming on to a it's a kind of a new thought but it's still the same the new testament battles according to the spirit and this is what it's talking about in ephesians 6 12 it says for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We cannot battle in the heavenly places if we are seated as the dust and the sand of the earth. We need to be seated in heaven to subdue the earth, to put our foot to the neck of our enemies, for to subdue the earth because in the old testament they had wars and battles i mean david in order to um um establish the kingdom he had to fight all of the uh the people who were against god who were against israel these were wars and battles swords shields but paul says that's all israel knew but but paul says to them in ephesians you are not to wrestle against flesh and blood, which was according to the Old Testament era, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness. And we do that. We battle according to the spirit, no longer to the flesh. And I also want to add that in subduing the earth in Genesis 1, where there was, God said, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, everything that, that is upon the ground, subdue it. But that is the natural form. But in the New Testament, the spiritual form is against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, which are the principalities, who are what? The prince of the air, which is Satan the principalities and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in another place you know it talks about you know demons they are ground dwellers we they, they that is in subduing the earth we deal with the demons on the ground the principalities in the air and there's a whole abyss in the sea there's an abyss in the sea where the gates of hell opened up and the beast will come out of it. And that is a whole other thing. And there is going to be no more sea in the new earth, the new Jerusalem, because the sea is not a good place. It's a place. It's a dwelling place of spirits, marine spirits, octopus spirits. This is real. So the, the Genesis 1 and the New Testament, we are subduing the earth, but the one was in the natural, but this one in the New Testament, us is in the supernatural. And we do it from the heavenly places as the descendants, the seed of the promise, which is Jesus. We do it through him because he has already paved the way he is the captain of our salvation salvation is to be saved out of something out of the world out of sin out of ourselves he has made the way but through abiding in him and following him that way is come to reality within us but it causes us to deny the flesh in the world and to look to christ in all things next thought we have two more and then we're done. Not that it matters. But in him, in Christ, who is the seed of the promise of blessing, one seed, many sons. So Galatians 3.16, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed, capital S, where the promise is made. He does not say, and two seeds, as of many, but as of one and your seed, who is Christ. So the seed Christ, Christ is the seed. The fulfillment of that promise is that the sons receive by faith that we become the sons of God. We are sons of God and sons of Abraham. So the seed was made to Abraham and Christ and the promise of that seed is fulfilled in us who by faith, who believe and by faith we become the sons and daughters of God. So we are sons. And when I just say sons, I mean sons and daughters. Even, even Paul says there is neither male nor female, slave nor free. I mean, it's, it's, I just include it, lump it into the sons. And that's just what I do. So we are sons of Abraham through faith. Him being the father of faith who believed the promise to whom it was made and that we receive the fulfillment of. In Galatians 3, 7, it says, Herefore, no. 
that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham, because he is the father of faith. Now we receive the promised blessing of Christ as the Spirit by being one with him as sons of God, fulfilling the promise. Galatians 3.28 For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So if we believe we are sons of God and we are also sons of Abraham. But now you have the Jewish Israelites who are the sons of Abraham, but they're not sons of the, the, the seed. They're not sons of God through the seed of promise because they're still living according to the Old Testament law. They have not received the New Testament as believers. And that's the distinction. That's also the ones who dwell as the dust of the earth and the sand of the, 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 the seashore. Only the angels, only the stars of heaven, those who are in the heavenlies are those who believe in the one who is the man of heaven, seated in heaven, in whom we are seated because he is in our spirit. Are you following this? Okay. So Ephesians 1, 3, it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 8. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And in Romans 8, 16, it says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The very spirit that seals us in our heart, the spirit of promise, is the one that witnesses, that bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And through that, in Christ, the gospel of our salvation, when we believe, we were sealed and also he has blessed us, I'm going back to 1-3, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There again, it testifies to the descendants that are as, as the stars of heaven. That's what it's talking to, those who believe in Christ. Those are the New Testament believers and the ones who are seated in Christ, the ones who obey Christ, because we could still believe in Christ but still be seated on the earth. So the blessing of the preaching of the gospel. This came from the seed of promise of Abraham. God's word, God's word to Abraham was the gospel. Same as Genesis 3.15, the seed of a woman. That was the first time the gospel was preached. To who? Satan. Adam heard it, believed, and called, looked to his, his wife, and he said, your name is Eve mother of all living because he believed the gospel so just as that when god's word to abraham was preached concerning the seed of promise which is the blessing of god upon all through whom all the nations of the earth is blessed and through whom the seed of promise was the spirit that would that would come into our spirit that we would become the sons of god when he proclaimed these promises to uh, abraham he preached the gospel to abraham so in galatians galatians 3 7 through 8 Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. And in preaching the gospel, and receiving the seed of promise, it turns us from our iniquities. If we hear it and we let it come into us and we respond, it says Acts 3, 25 through 26, it says, you are sons of the prophets and the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So Jesus bore the curse of the law 
redeeming sinners from becoming a curse by becoming a curse for us, fulfilling the law in our place. In Galatians, we talked about this last week, the seed of a, uh, well, it's, uh, we named it something else, um, to overcome death by life. I suggest reading that because this all ties together. Galatians 3.13, it said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. He died the death and he paid the price so we didn't have to. Through believing and having his spirit in us, not only are we redeemed from the curse, but through his spirit, we are able to keep the law. Which means we walk according to the spirit and we fulfill the law because we are loving the Lord our God with all our mind, all our strength, all our heart. We are walking according to the Spirit and a Spirit in us enables us to walk in obedience where we automatically are doing what God says we need to do when He set the standard of the character of His children that they couldn't meet because they were born according to the flesh. But if you're born according to the Spirit, you're living according to the life of Jesus and if you're living according to the life of Jesus, you're able to keep the standard of holiness because he is holy in us, enabling us to be holy and perfect as he is holy and he is perfect. So the blessing of Abraham is the promise of the spirit, our inheritance of God himself as Christ the last Adam. So Galatians 3.14, it says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Now the spirit is the spirit of Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 15.45, it says, so it is written, the first man became a living being. That's a living soul. The last Adam so that was the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, which is the Holy Spirit in us. Romans 8, 9, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Second Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When I received this revelation, the Godhead made so much more sense to me. Because I was so confused because how it's portrayed a lot of times is we have the God, the father, God, the son, and God, the spirit, three separate persons. Well, the spirit and Christ are two separate persons. And I, I was like, uh, but when we read these scriptures that I just said, we realize that we have God, the father, we have Jesus, the son and the Holy spirit, which is the spirit of Jesus in us that we may be brought into God and God into us. See, heaven isn't the destination. According to John, the Father is the destination. How in, 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 in John 14, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Where, where, that where I am, there you may be also. So what he's talking about is he went to the cross. He was resurrected in order to prepare a place for us that through him, we are brought into the father as many abodes because he says in my father's house, there are many mansions. That's the new King James version, but that's not what it means. Mansion, what it really means is abodes abodes dwelling places so in we are living stones we are members of christ we are many abodes where in the father because jesus in his prayer in 17 he says as my desire that they be in me and i in them just as i am in you and you are in me i pray that they are one with us as we are one how is that possible? But through Christ, we are seated in the Father. How? Because Christ is in the Father. And we are in Christ. And the Father is the destination. That's where Jesus went. When he was resurrected, taken heaven, he went to the Father. 
It's about the Father. It's not about heaven. Where was I? <laughs> and another thing, and I forgot to say this, that when we, how are we able to put our feet to the enemy? When we are positioned in Christ and in obedience, we are operating in His authority. And what is that authority? Yes, the name of Jesus is the name above all names. And at that name, every knee will bow. But the Spirit also in us reveals the person of Jesus because he is Jesus. So the name is Jesus and the person of Jesus is the spirit. And if we live according to the spirit, we're living according to the person of Jesus in whom all the authority of heaven and earth is given. And that is how we can operate according to his authority because we are living according to him by his spirit in us, which is the person of Jesus. It's not two people, it's one. There's three in one, one in three. It's amazing. Okay. So our last thought. Christ is the seed of Abraham. And we are Abraham's seed through faith. So Galatians 3.29. And this is how I'm closing this up. Because it was really hard for me to, how to figure out how to do this. So Galatians 3.29 says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All right. So the seed of a woman in Galatians 3.15, that was the son sent to accomplish redemption. The seed of Abraham, which is according to Genesis 12, is the spirit of the son sent into our hearts to accomplish adoption. So the seed of the woman was the son being sent. The seed of Abraham was the spirit being sent. You're seeing the gospel in this? This is the gospel. This is God giving us a picture of the gospel in a way so we can have a fuller understanding. This is incredible how he works. So Galatians 4, 4 through 5 and verse 6. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into the hearts, into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. He sent the son, then he sent the spirit. And we also see this in John when he says, he says that I asked the father that he may send you another comforter. But Jesus had to go first in order for that comforter to come. That's a picture of this right here in the Old Testament is a picture of that. So as the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ became the life-giving spirit. And that is 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So the seed of the woman sent the, sent the son. The seed of Abraham sent the spirit. Now the seed of David, which we're talking about next week, that sends the kingdom. Because as the seed of David, he is, who is Jesus, is the seed of David, the conquering king who brings in his kingdom and who builds the house of God of which we are living stones. We are the house of God and we are the kingdom. He is the kingdom and we are under him and we are also the kingdom. In Daniel 7, 13 through 14, well, first, I'm going, to, I'm going to say something about the kingdom. So when Jesus first went preaching the gospel, he said, repent, and because, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe in the gospel, for the kingdom of God is at hand. At the beginning of his ministry, because he alone was the kingdom. There was no, this was before he started sending his disciples out. He alone was the kingdom. But then he said, I have given you power and authority to go out. And he told them, Preach the gospel. Tell them, repent, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. Why? Because they were the kingdom. They were the kingdom. We are the kingdom under the lordship of Jesus Christ to build his kingdom. Oh, it's so... Man, 
It is amazing. So in Daniel 7, 13 through 14, it says, I was watching. This is Daniel. He's prophesying about the seed of David. He said, I was watching the fulfillment of the seed of David. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. We have to understand the kingdom of God will go on forever and anyone that is in that kingdom. If we live according to the kingdom of Satan, if we refuse to come out from the land of idolatry, if we refuse to come out from under the, the lordship and tyranny and the, the servitude of Satan, us serving Satan through sin, if we refuse to come out of that, deny ourselves and, and be in Christ, we will be judged according to that kingdom. And that kingdom is going to be judged by fire. This world is going to be consumed with fire. And the Satan and his kingdom and all those who refuse to separate from sin and from serving him will be in the lake of fire in eternal separation from God. Because if we deny him here, we deny him there. It is very important. We must repent. We must come to a knowledge of God that's through his word. And we must come in, in his word and in prayer. Ask for forgiveness from God. Repent. Give forgiveness where we hold on to unforgiveness. Renounce ungodliness. Come out of the sin. Sever the soul ties of those that we have made through sin. We are to separate. We are to turn to Christ. We need to live a life of repentance. And John the Baptist says, who are you to Think you can um, escape the coming wrath? Are you able to bear the fruits of repentance? He denied the Pharisees to be baptized because he knew that they wouldn't even um, um, bear the fruits of repentance. They wouldn't even live a life of repentance. They, uh, you, we need to come with repentance in our hearts. In our hearts, we confess. It is important before it is too late because if we die or when Jesus comes back uh, at the second appearing, whichever happens first, and we stand before the Father of all glory, the Father in heaven and Jesus Christ, we're going to stand before Jesus Christ because all judgment has come, has been given to the Son because he is the son of man, which qualifies him to judge man because he was born a baby, was raised up on this earth, fully God, fully man. He had the full capabilities of, 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 of sinning, but he didn't. He lived a perfect life that he would be the lamb of God, that he would die on the cross in, in a sinless man on account of sin, taking the curse of the world upon him him being judged in the likeness of the serpent which judged the devil which in doing that he took back the keys of death that anyone who looked at looks at Jesus and believes in him will no longer be under the dominion of death no longer under the curse of sin but we will be free children of God that we can live according to his spirit in us and not according to our flesh and the lusts of our mind that we may have eternity with God eternal life and when we stand before him he says, I do not judge you in John. He says, but my words will judge you. These words by this book, we will be judged. So we need to read it and do what it says because we have been enabled to partake of the tree of life, which the access to the tree of life was opened up to us in the spirit that every day, every moment we can feast upon the spirit and we can live according to the spirit. 
And this is true that when we stand before him, it'll be too late. We cannot say we're sorry. We cannot say, but, um, we cannot say, but this or, but they did. None of that matters. We will not be speaking. This word will be speaking and this word will witness against us because we have access to it. This is the manna from heaven. This is the book of life. And we need to know what it says and do what it says according to the spirit of Jesus Christ, who is, he died to give us that we could have the inheritance of the sons of God as the descendants of Abraham in the heavens. 